Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Emily Silva, and I'm the NECAN coordinator. I'd like to welcome you to the first webinar in the NECAN Student and Early Career Scientist series, in which we will be highlighting the works of students, PhD candidates, and early career scientists whose work focuses on ocean and coastal acidification. The full webinar schedule can be found on the NECAN website and each webinar will be recorded and posted there as well. As of right now, the next webinar is scheduled for Monday, March 8th, 2021. However, more webinars are being scheduled and in the meantime, um, so keep an eye on the website and our newsletter for updates. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, you can submit them through the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, and we will go through each of those during the Q&A session um, following the presentation. Today, we'll be hearing from Amalia Harrington from the University of Maine and Maine Sea Grant on the combined impacts of ocean acidification and warming on juvenile American lobster. Amalia is a Marine Extension Associate with Maine Sea Grant at the University of Maine. She's also the Northeast Regional Lobster Extension Project Coordinator with her current work focused on increasing American lobster industry's resilience to the biological, economic, and social impacts of ecosystem change across the Northeast. Prior to joining Maine Sea Grant, she received a master's degree from San Diego State University, where she studied the habitat use and sheltering behaviors of the California spiny lobster. She also received her doctorate from the University of Maine's School of Marine Sciences, where she examined the physiological effects of climate change on multiple life history stages of the American lobster. Today, she'll be presenting findings from her postdoctoral work with Dr. Heather Hamlin at the University of Maine. With that, I'll hand things over to you, Amalia, um, and you can take us to your presentation. Great. Um, do I need to click anything to share my screen? I'm sorry. Yep, I'll send you something right now. I should get a little box. Perfect. Can you see my slides? Great. Well, thank you, Emily, for that introduction. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Amalia Harrington, and um, today I'm going to be talking about some of my work with my colleagues listed here, Robert Harrington, Debbie Bouchard, and Heather Hamlin uh, at the University of Maine in the School of Marine Sciences. So the, the title is kind of a mouthful, but broadly speaking, my work tries to understand the impacts of climate change on, on American lobsters, um, and specifically, my work uh, is focused on two impacts of climate change, uh, global ocean warming, or OW, as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation, and global ocean acidification, or OA, which is the decrease in ocean pH. Now, both of these processes are unique in and of themselves, but they are both related to the increase in the input of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from the mid 20th century onward. When we think about ocean warming, we know that temperatures across the world's oceans are increasing rapidly, but some of the most accelerated rates of warming are occurring in the Northwest Atlantic, particularly in my study region, the Gulf of Maine area outlined by this black box here in this, this picture, figure, figure from Mills et al. in 2013. Now, in addition to these rapid rates of warming, we're also seeing an increase in both the frequency and the intensity of extreme warming events or ocean heat waves. And all of this warming can have a variety of effects of organisms that live in the Gulf of Maine region, including direct effects such as reduced survival and then recruitment to the fishery, as we've seen in the northern shrimp, as well as indirect effects through novel interactions of species that are not common in the Gulf of Maine, such as black sea bass coming into um, the Gulf of Maine as it warms. Now, it's important to note when we talk about warming in the Gulf of Maine region that we acknowledge that there is this steep and natural latitudinal gradient in temperature across the region, where we have warmer surface temperatures as indicated by the warmer colors down in Southern New England that get progressively cooler as you move into the uh, waters off of Midcoast Maine and into Canada. <clears throat> now we know from some work on other species and other systems that organisms that uh, have their distributions across these types of latitudinal gradients might exhibit some level of adaptation to warmer temperatures, such that uh, warm water species might be more heat tolerant than those 
um, from cold water areas. However, a lot of this work hasn't been done in the Gulf of Maine region specifically, nor has it taken into account these rapid rates of warming that we're seeing in our area. <clears throat> when it comes to ocean acidification, uh, what I'm really talking about is changes in ocean chemistry. And just to remind you all of, of what happens when we have a buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is more gets drawn down into the surface of the ocean. And now the carbon dioxide can go through a variety of different chemical processes, but one of the biggest things that happens is that we get an increase in the concentration or the amount of hydrogen ions in the water, which makes waters more acidic and lowers the pH. However, some of these hydrogen ions can also interact with carbonate ions, thus removing one of the major building blocks of, of shells and hard forming parts when it comes to calcifying organisms. So we know that uh, there are a number of different effects on calcifying organisms, including reduced growth and survival when exposed to low pH environments. But there are a whole host of other effects of, of uh, changes in ocean pH, including uh, disruption in the ability to um, find and detect uh, different chemical cues, changes in behavior, as well as some bigger picture effects such as changes in energy allocation. But What's uh, really important here is that we have um, really a lot of information left to gain when it comes to um, finding these inconsistent trends across taxonomic groups. So not every organism is gonna respond the same way. And we also know that life history stages will respond differently. So larvae may respond differently compared to adult life history stages. So there's a lot of information left to learn. Now, if we zoom in again, on the Gulf of Maine region more specifically, we know that this area may be prone to both these large scale patterns of ocean acidification, but also these more localized effects of coastal acidification. So we know that this region has a, a relatively low buffering capacity due to high freshwater input and low temperatures. And what we might get throughout a seasonal events is a lot of precipitation and runoff into coastal areas, resulting in these localized formations of um, corrosive plumes, as indicated by the red areas here, um, which makes it oops, uh, difficult for shell forming organisms to build their hard parts. Um, so with that in mind, thinking about acidification and warming, um, why should we study the American lobster? For those of you that are not familiar with the American lobster, this sustains the um, most productive in terms of economic value, single species fishery in the Gulf of Maine and Atlantic Canada. And in the state of Maine where I'm located, uh, this species is not only economically important in terms of bringing in excess of $491 million to our state, it's also culturally important and um, provides really a sense of, um, of um, cultural identity to our uh, region. And we also know that the American lobster distribution spans that natural thermal gradient and may also experience uh, periods of coastal acidification, making it an ideal species for understanding uh, the combined effects of acidification in warming. So when I first came to the University of Maine, um, a lot of the work looking at um, climate change impacts on American lobsters focused either on larval stages or adult stages. So some of the work that we've seen um, in other presenters during um, the NECAN webinar series has demonstrated that warming can accelerate uh, developmental rates being beneficial somewhat, but um, we've found in our lab that this might be offset by increased stress levels and alterations in gene expression patterns. When it comes to looking at acidification, um, we also know that, that larvae may be impacted in terms of growth and survival, as well as changes in gene expression patterns as well. Uh, the work that's been done looking more at these stressors in the context of adult lobsters suggests that warming um, alters the number of immune cells in lobster blood, um, but when it comes to a low pH environment, it doesn't seem to affect calcification rates um, in lobsters in their adult stage. But really what we uh, don't have a good idea of is um, understanding what's going on in juvenile stages. That is lobsters that have already transitioned to the benthos, uh, but are not yet reproductively mature. 
So the idea here is that whatever these juvenile lobsters are experiencing, if there are any uh, potential energetic trade-offs as a result of environmental stress, uh, that could have huge implications on how they uh, respond as adults and whether or not they can you know, perform normal behaviors of adult lobsters. So some of the work that I did uh, as part of my dissertation really focused on understanding the effects of ocean acidification on juvenile lobsters. And we found that a, a low pH environment affects some aspects of the internal chemistry of lobsters, uh, but not all of the processes. Uh, what was interesting though, is that we did find that lobsters exposed to acidification had a lower immune cell count, uh, potentially leading to immunosuppression. Um, and what's really interesting is that we found that um, lobsters exposed to acidification had uh, reduced capacity to deal with additional stressors, in this case, a thermal stress, meaning that there was something going on physiologically to compromise them when they were exposed to this stressor. Uh, but what was uh, really obvious from this work is that we need to understand the combined effects of acidification and warming and not just look at these factors alone. So that brought me to uh, one component of my postdoc research, uh, which has two major objectives that I'm going to talk about today. The first is understanding the individual and the combined effects of acidification and warming on juvenile lobster physiology through an environmental stressor experiment. And then the second objective is to really take this a step further and look at sort of the downstream effects of these stressors when it comes to biological processes, specifically disease susceptibility through a discrete pathogen challenge. So to get this experiment started, we conducted a, a research experiment at the Aquaculture Research Center at the University of Maine using four recirculating seawater systems. So this is a, a picture of kind of our, our setup where you see four uh, discrete uh, individual systems that have four tanks each with a, a lid, so they're sealed. And each of these tanks, if you were to take the lid off, was subdivided to house three juvenile lobsters each. In order to set up our experimental design, we had a fully factorial uh, experimental design with two temperature treatments a current temperature of about 16 degrees Celsius to mimic our current conditions in the summertime of mid-coast Maine, and a predicted end-century warming of 20 degrees Celsius. When we chose our pH treatments, our current conditions were about 8.0, and our predicted end-century acidified conditions were a pH of about 7.6. So lobsters that experienced both current temperatures and pH conditions will be referred to as current condition treatment. Lobsters that experienced a current pH but warming experienced ocean warming only, or OW. Lobsters that experienced current temperatures but a low pH environment experienced acidification, or OA only. And then lobsters that got kind of the double whammy of both predicted warming and acidification conditions were considered acidification and warming, or OAW. <clears throat> and these, uh, these symbols here or these descriptions of the treatments will be used throughout the experiment or through the presentation. So just keep that in mind moving forward. <clears throat> and I do also want to mention that in order to increase our sample size, we ran all of the experiments that I'm going to talk about twice. And in order to potentially account for any uh, system effects, we reassigned which system got what treatment uh, in each of our, dis our separate rounds. So what we did is we added uh, three juvenile female lobsters to each of our tanks. This picture right here shows you what the tanks look like uh, when you take the lid off. And we chose females only to account for any potential effects of lobster sex on the metrics that we uh, were looking at here. So we added our lobsters and exposed them to their environmental stressors for 42 days. And we didn't do anything in terms of uh, measuring anything with our lobsters specifically. We just kept measurements of our water chemistry, fed our lobsters, but really didn't do anything until after this 42-day exposure, where we uh, first measured uh, and took samples of lobster blood or hemolymph to do hemocyte counts. And then we put them through um, an additional stress test to measure cardiac performance during a thermal stress. After these experiments, we moved on to our second objective, which again was that pathogen challenge. But to kind of keep things straight, I'm going to focus on these two components as they directly relate to the first objective before coming back to the pathogen challenge. <clears throat> 
Now, the first thing I want to do, though, is explain why hemocytes and what they are and, and why they are important components to measure. Um, and lobsters, unlike you and I, lack an adaptive immune system, but they have this really complex innate immune system that's capable of distinguishing self from non-self, eliminating pathogens by engulfing foreign invaders, as well as healing wounds through a clotting mechanism. And the primary cells of this response are the hemocytes. And in our case, we're lumping all of the hemocytes together to get a total hemocyte count. <clears throat> now, what's really interesting about hemocytes is they're also involved in the stress response system. So uh, we know that they're a really good indicator of, of crustacean stress levels as well. And some of the previous work that uh, has looked at the individual effects of acidification and warming on hemocyte counts, uh, they've found different results. So work on adult lobsters suggests that short-term warming increases hemocyte counts, likely as lobsters are responding to the cellular stress that they're feeling. Um, but some of the work that I've done with some juvenile lobsters, as well as work on other clawed lobsters, has demonstrated that long-term exposure to acidification actually reduces hemocyte counts, potentially uh, reducing disease susceptibility, so impacting immunity here. But really what's, what's unclear is what are the combined effects of acidification and warming um, on these hemocyte counts. So to get at this, we drew our lobster blood samples as pictured up here, and then we preserved our, our samples in a fixative and counted them on uh, hemocytometers, which are pictured down here. And uh, while hemocytes are a really good indicator of stress, they are notoriously variable within an animal as well as over time. So to account for any sort of uh, impact of just being in the lab, laboratory conditions um, on hemocyte counts, we had an additional set of lobsters that served as our handling control. So these lobsters were not uh, stressed out at all. All that we did was um, measure hemocyte counts um, throughout this experiment and really didn't expose them to any other stressors, handling or otherwise. So what did we find? What we're going to see here is hemocyte counts on the y-axis for all of our treatments, including that handling control on the x-axis. And uh, not surprisingly, what we found was a significant effect of treatment on hemocyte counts as indicated by the different letters above these box plots. Um, but what was really interesting is that the highest hemocyte counts was observed in our handling controls, but these uh, lobsters were not statistically different from lobsters exposed to current conditions. When we looked at lobsters that were exposed to uh, just the current temperature outlined in blue, so that 16 degree treatment, we did not see a significant effect of pH. And similarly, when we looked at just the um, effect of, of warming here, our different warming groups were not statistically different from one another. Uh, but you can see a really clear difference here based on, on temperature. So in fact, lobsters that were exposed to current temperature conditions of 16 degrees Celsius had hemocyte counts that were about two and a half times higher than those that were exposed to our warming scenarios. And if you compare our acidification, warming, and then the OAW treatments to our handling control, you can see that hemocyte counts were, were lower than our true control under any stressor. So there's clearly something going on within our animals that's um, stressing them out or, or causing some sort of physiological or immunological effect here. Um, but really the best way to get a handle on that was to look at the whole organismal or lobster level to stress. So we conducted a stress test essentially similar to what you might experience if you go to the doctor and they put you on a treadmill and they measure your heart rate, but here we're doing it with lobsters. So Lobsters have a variety of tools in their toolkit to help them maintain biological functions when they're under stress, but there is a threshold or a limit to this compensation, and that's what we are really trying to measure here. So when we talk about physiological performance, we can talk about a variety of different metrics, but here specifically, we're looking at cardiac performance or heart rate under our stressor of thermal stress. So again, this is like a stress test, but instead of putting lobsters on a treadmill, we put them in a in a tank where we increased the temperature and looked at heart rate. And really what we were trying to get at here was to look at the whole organismal level to see if lobsters pre-exposed to these different environmental stressors had different responses when it comes to heart rate. 
And so this is just a picture of what our, our temperature ramping experiment setup looks like, again, measuring cardiac performance as we increase temperature. So um, this white styrofoam cooler here is our experimental arena where I could increase the temperature from 16 degrees up to 29 degrees Celsius over about two hours. So a pretty aggressive ramp. And if we zoom into this cooler and look at what the lobster is experiencing and what it looks like, you can see how we measure heart rate. So we very carefully um, hand drilled two very tiny holes on either side of the lobster's heart and implanted electrodes, which I've highlighted here in red for you. And so these electrodes allowed us to measure heart rate in real time as we increased the temperature in our arena. And again, we did this for all of our lobsters. Uh, we did not do this for the handling controls, but just for the lobsters that we are experiencing our environmental stressors. And now what I'm gonna show you are the results of those uh, temperature ramping experiments showing heart rate as beeps per minute on the y-axis over the course of the temperature ramp in Celsius on the x. Lobsters exposed to current conditions will be identified by light blue circles. Those that experience acidification only are in the uh, dark blue triangles. Lobsters exposed to warming only are going to be in the um, pale red squares. And those experiencing acidification and warming are indicated by those uh, bright red <clears throat> excuse me, diamonds. In this color scheme and these shapes will be consistent <clears throat> throughout the rest of the presentation. So across all of our treatments, we saw that as temperature increased in the arena, so did heart rate. And this makes sense again, because as, as lobsters are experiencing temperature increases and energy demands increase to help maintain cellular function, um, under this moderate stress, you would expect to see an increase in heart rate. <clears throat> However, as we pushed the temperature even further and increased it even more, we saw that over time, heart rate became erratic and eventually started to decline. And again, this was consistent across all of the environmental stressor experiments, and this is what we would expect to see. And again, if we were to push these lobsters even further, uh, warming the temperature even more, we might expect a heart rate to decline and fall to zero as lobsters were unable to compensate fully for increasing temperature. But really what we wanted to know is, is there a difference in this threshold temperature? So this point where the heart rate starts to uh, decrease with increasing temperature, and this is called the Arrhenius break temperature, or what I'll refer to as the ABT moving forward. And when we looked at this break temperature across our different environmental stressor treatments, we saw clear significant differences based on what environmental stressors they experienced. When we looked at those lobsters that were exposed to 16 degrees, so our current temperature treatments, we saw a clearly significant decrease uh, in lobsters exposed to acidification as indicated by the letters here relative to our current conditions. Similarly, when we looked at just those lobsters exposed to warming, we saw a dramatic decrease in uh, ABT uh, when lobsters were exposed to a low pH environment again. So regardless of temperature, we see that this break temperature is significantly reduced under a low pH environment. But what was uh, most striking from these data was if we compared our current conditions lobsters to the double whammy lobsters of acidification and warming, and we saw that on average, the break temperature in these acidification and warming lobsters was about three degrees Celsius lower than those exposed to current conditions. And while three degrees Celsius might not seem a lot, again, this is the break temperature. So that's the point where they're starting to be extremely physiologically compromised and unable to deal with these stressors. I just wanna recap really quickly from the environmental stress exposure before moving on to the, the next objective here. Uh, what we found clearly was that uh, warming alone seems to have the major influence on total hemocyte counts here, significantly reducing cell counts regardless of pH. However, within both of the distinct temperature treatments, mean Arrhenius break temperature was significantly reduced in those lobsters exposed to acidified versus current pH conditions. And now if we focus in here on the double effects or the combined effects of acidification and warming, these lobsters both had low hemocyte counts, but also had the lowest break temperature. Um, again, this was three degrees lower than those current conditions lobsters. 
So together, this suggests that um, lobsters exposed to both acidification and warming are physiologically stressed. So there's something going on here. But again, just to point out here, this, this temperature ramping experiment is a stress test. And, and you know, lobsters are mobile. So if they encounter really uncomfortable temperatures that are too warm, they're likely going to walk away. So while this gives us an idea of the capacity to deal with stress, we really wanted to take this to the next level and think about something more uh, ecologically or biologically relevant. And here, we wanted to tie the hemocyte counts into the environmental stressors to really get an idea of how this relates to disease susceptibility in lobsters. So this brings us to the second objective, which again, um, followed the uh, experiments that I mentioned here, and we, um, conducted a 21-day pathogen challenge with our lobsters. And since we were working with um, an infectious agent, we moved our lobsters over to the Diagnostic Research Laboratory at the University of Maine. And once the lobsters were there, they were assigned one of two injection treatments. They were either given a sham injection, which was just sterile saline, or they were injected with our pathogen, which was Aerococcus viridens. Um, or AV for the remainder of this presentation. Now, AV is a gram-positive bacterium that uh, causes gafkemia. For those of you that are not familiar with gafkemia, this is generally thought of as, as an impoundment disease that causes extreme lethargy and loss of appetite in lobsters. So it's, a, it's considered a metabolic wasting disease. And although this uh, hasn't really been detected in post-capture main lobsters, um, since about you know, the, the early 2000s, um, we do think that this was a, a really ideal candidate for our experimental uh, purposes because we know that the progression of the infection is accelerated under warming conditions, and it also results in these really clear observable changes in, in lobster behavior, making it a great way to, to see how exposure to these different stressors influences lobsters. So we injected our lobsters with their treatments and then we assess their behavior daily for, for three weeks or 21 days. So we're looking for lobsters to see if they were active or lethargic or if they were eventually moribund and passed away. And upon death, we took a number of biological samples, but today I'm going to focus on, on the hemolymph samples. So again, we took blood samples similar to what we saw uh, in the first objective, but in this case, we plated these samples immediately onto our blood agar plates. Uh, which you can see up here. And we allowed the bacteria to grow uh, in an incubator for about 24 hours. And what we were looking for here was colony formation, where we have that really nice, clear colony uh, in the center, surrounded by uh, sort of a halo around where the bacterium has consumed the, the auger. But just to, to doubly confirm that this is what the pathogen that we thought, um, we did a gram stain, again, looking for these really pretty purple uh, tetrads that are characteristic of, of AV. And then after the uh, 21 days, all of the lobsters that survived uh, were sacrificed and sampled similarly. And from, from these studies, what I'm going to show you first is the cumulative survival. So on this figure here, cumulative survival of one means that the entire population is alive, uh, whereas zero means that everybody has uh, deceased or passed away. Um, and again, using those same coloring and symbols as I presented earlier. Now, what we saw here really uh, was, was high mortality across all of our different environmental stressors and no significant difference um, across our different uh, pre-exposure uh, stressor treatments in uh, cumulative survival or bulk survival rates. But what was uh, really interesting is if we draw this line here showing 50% mortality, which means half of the population is, has to come to the infection, we saw that lobsters that were uh, pre-exposed to warming conditions cross this threshold at about day 11, but lobsters exposed to current temperatures of about 16 degrees Celsius didn't cross this threshold until about day 15. So overall, although there's no statistical difference in overall survival curve, as depicted here, or rates of survival, lobsters that were pre-exposed to warming conditions died up to five days sooner than those uh, that were exposed to our current conditions treatment. <clears throat> And uh, finally, something that was really interesting that we didn't really set out to, to measure, but was really interesting nonetheless, 
was uh, was claw loss. So here you're going to see the percentage of lobsters that were injected with a pathogen that had either no claw loss as the light gray bars or lost at least one claw from the from the um, indicated by the darker gray bars here. And when we looked at the um, current conditions and then the effects of either acidification or warming alone, we saw that overall uh, about a quarter of the lobsters lost at least one claw. Um, but what was really striking and really different here is if we look at those lobsters pre-exposed to both acidification and warming, we saw that over half of lo those lobsters lost at least one claw. So again, no statistical difference, but there's clearly a trend going on here. And, and losing a claw is a really big deal if you're a lobster because you, you use your claws for pretty much everything, handling food, mating. So really, this is a, a really striking difference that could have some huge implications um, biologically for lobsters. So overall, looking at uh, the results of the pathogen challenge, we found uh, no clear statistical difference in overall rates of survival um, and really no difference in those survival curves. However, lobsters exposed to warming conditions tended to die faster than those exposed to our current conditions um, when it comes to temperature. So this means that there's something going on that may have uh, compromised them immunologically prior to entering this pathogen challenge. Um, and again, although not statistically significant, these data suggest a strong link between acidification and warming exposure and claw loss during infection of AV in American lobsters. <clears throat> Now, I know I covered a, a lot of information and probably spoke pretty quickly because I'm very excited, um, but I just want to kind of wrap everything up um, and connect all the dots across these different components. Um, so really, when we looked at the effects of ocean warming alone or warming conditions on the lobsters, we found that warming alone did not either benefit or hinder cardiac performance. So it had no significant effect on the Arrhenius break temperature measured here. But we did see that warming uh, alone seemed to have the greatest influence on total hemocyte counts, significantly reducing cell counts regardless of pH. And these lowered hemocyte counts may have contributed to the accelerated time to death in lobsters pre-exposed to warmer temperatures during the pathogen challenge. So we know from previous research that hemocytes are unable to successfully engulf AV cells during infection, meaning that these hemocytes aren't able to do their job. So uh, trying to capture AV actually leads to a decline in hemocyte counts. So if lobsters pre-exposed to warming conditions um, um, had lower hemocyte counts going into the pathogen challenge, it's possible that this set them up to fail, so to speak, in terms of, of limiting the functionality of the remaining hemocytes, which could have contributed to the disease pro progression as we saw here. <clears throat> In contrast, when we looked at the effects of just acidification only on the metrics we measured here, we found um, that OA, or a low pH environment, was the main driver of the cardiac performance results we saw here. So within both of the discrete uh, temperature treatments, mean ABT was significantly reduced in lobsters exposed to a low pH environment compared to current conditions. Um, interestingly, though, we saw no clear effect of OA alone on hemocyte counts or time to death when we um, had our pathogen challenge. <clears throat> Things got a little bit more complicated though when we looked at the combined effects of acidification and warming. Um, and really what we found here was that uh, when we compared these lobsters exposed to both of the stressors, um, compared to all other treatment groups, these lobsters had the lowest mean ABT or break temperature than any other uh, group that we tested here. And remember, this was about three degrees lower than the current conditions group. So this suggests that lobsters exposed to predicted end century warming and acidification may be at risk of incurring greater energetic demands at lower temperatures relative to our current conditions environment in order to deal with cellular stress or potentially damage associated with um, acute warming events. These lobsters also had significantly reduced hemocyte counts compared to those exposed to current conditions, which again may have contributed to faster mortality rates uh, uh, due to reduced function of hemocytes, as I previously discussed. Um, but we also know that declines in hemocyte counts um, impairs the clotting mechanism in lobsters, 
um, infected with AV. And this could lead to fatal hemorrhaging. So if they're wounded and they can't clot, this might be a really big problem when it comes to dealing with, um, dealing with surviving under these conditions. And this is particularly important here, as we saw that lobsters exposed to acidification and warming more often lost their claws than any other group. So not only could they, um, they lose their claw and that prevents a, a major disadvantage under normal conditions, but uh, this may prove fatal during infection uh, with AV due to an increase in risk for secondary infections through sort of um, uh, an opportunistic invasion through um, a hole in the carapace, or it could lead to uh, hemorrhaging and bleeding to death, which would be um, extremely tragic in this situation for the lobster. So overall, the, the metrics that we looked at here and the results that we found suggest that the combined effects of acidification and warming result in greater physiological damage or, or stress levels compared to the effects of either of these factor, factors on their own. Um, and uh, what's really important to note, though, is that this is just the beginning in understanding the effects of acidification and warming on, on juvenile lobsters. So really the next steps are to try and understand the potential energetic trade-offs. So what does it mean when they're dealing with these stressors? What are the costs associated with this? Are they able to uh, perform other energetically expensive processes? Specifically here, thinking about how this relates to the molt cycle. As we know, this is an extremely energetic expensive uh, process here. So future work would really benefit from prolonging the exposure in lobsters to these different stressors and looking at the, the potential effects on molting and successful molting. And it's also important to note that while we did look at multiple stressors here, uh, changing environments are gonna, gonna include other things other than just temperature and uh, changes in ocean chemistry. So we need to think about changes in oxygen availability, salinity stress, as well as the potential for pollutants to, to impact lobsters. So really the push needs to keep going in that direction of considering multiple stressors moving forward. And finally, while the pathogen that we chose here was a really good fit for our experimental design and the questions that we're asking here, um, we know that as the, the environment conti continues to change, especially thinking about warming, there are gonna be additional or novel pathogens that will come and present a, a potential challenge for lobsters. So continuing this work in the context of other uh, potential pathogens is really important as well. So with that, I'd like to thank um, all of my collaborators uh, in this project, including um, those listed here and on the, the front slide, Robert Harrington, Debbie Bouchard, and Heather Hamlin. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the support in both collection of animals and, and system design and maintenance, as well as my funding sources. And uh, with that, I think we have uh, plenty of time for some questions here. Thank you, Amalia. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions um, to start off with. I just want to uh, encourage everybody to submit their questions they might have through the questions tab. Um, so the first one we have asks um, if you recorded or saw any effects on growth rate between OA, OW, and OAW? That's a good question. Um, so our, our experiment was, our exposure experiment was only um, 42 days, um, and we um, didn't observe really any major growth in our lobsters. These lobsters, I should mention, were uh, 50 to 60 millimeters carapace length in size, so juvenile lobsters. Um, and there really wasn't a statistical difference in terms of the initial size or the final size across any of our experiments. Um, so yeah, that would be a really interesting thing to look at uh, with a longer term exposure, looking at growth rates. Um, but unfortunately, the time limit of our experiment didn't allow us to do that. Okay, um, so the next question asks, how did you control pH in the 7.6 and the 8.0 tanks? And did you correct for the effect of temperature on pH in your measurements? Um, was the seawater in the tank a closed system? Yeah, so, so we controlled our, our pH in our systems using uh, a combination of bubbling in CO2. Um, we used a, a LICOR gas analyzer to make sure we had the proper amounts of pCO2 in our systems. Um, so yes, temperature did affect um, our, our readings a little bit. So there was a little bit of a difference between um, 
the overall pH in our um, warm and acidified conditions versus our cooler acidified conditions. Um, but we kept really good control on this through um, using, like I said, our, our Lycor as well as a, a DuraFET to measure our pH. And we did, since we were using recirculating systems, we were able to um, do water changes as needed to help keep our chemistry really in check. Um, so that was really beneficial and one of the benefits of, of using our recirculating system um, is we had a really great um, control over the amount of water that we changed and, and the incoming chemistry. Um, so that was really helpful, I think. Okay, and our next question asks, um, how do you think adding variability to the pH and temperature treatments, um, for example, variability that mimics style or tidal changes in pH and temperatures um, might affect lobster health? Yeah, I think that's a great question and, and something that we definitely need to look into. Um, uh, clearly, the, the setup that we have um, was looking for these discrete and sort of bulk differences in chemistry. So um, it definitely didn't account for the daily variation that we see. Um, so I think really trying to get at the potential for um, adaptation to this changing environment, it would be really important to mimic what's actually going in the natural environment. And the system that we have actually has the capacity to change the chemistry to kind of get at some of those questions so we can add PCO2 and change the pH in a way that will reflect sort of the tidal cycle. Um, but that was outside of the scope of this experiment here. Um, I do think that, you know, lobsters are extremely resilient creatures. Um, so again, this is looking at two snapshots, current versus predicted end century. So there's great potential for um, lobsters to more gradually acclimate to these conditions in the natural environment. Um, but I think really the next step is again, to look at not just these sort of two endpoints, as well as considering sort of the natural variation within a day, but also looking at a range of temperatures and pH um, treatments combinations. But again, you know, the more treatments you combine, the, the more problematic it is with a sample size to get really, to really get at your statistical results here. But again, really important to think about in a changing environment for lobsters. All right. Um, so the next one <clears throat> at first just wants to confirm um, that the level of re replication for your experiment was individual lobsters and then asks, um, there were three lobsters in each pod. So did you worry about pseudo replication? Yep. And that's that's the killer, right? And in, in all of these lab based experiments is is how do you increase your sample size to get really good replication across your treatments? Um, and how do you account for that potential for pseudo replication? And um, for our statistical analyses, we treated the tank as our replication, um, but for each of the individual measurements of say the ABT, all of those lobsters were, were run individually. So um, it takes two hours per animal and each lobster was in its own little tank individually. But yes, there is a, a potential for pseudo replication here, but um, the fact that we ran this experiment twice and, and mixed up which treatments were what in our systems and we found the same results really gives us confidence that, that moving forward, we're, we are clearly seeing an effect of the stressors here. Um, we originally planned to run this three times, but uh, due to winter in Maine, um, we kind of had to scale back a little bit. So yeah, um, if I had unlimited time and unlimited money, I would definitely run um, this experiment multiple, multiple times to really account for that pseudo replication uh, holding animals within the same tank. All right. Um, well, that was actually, that's our last question. Um, so if anybody else wants to uh, submit any questions, we can wait um, one more minute um, for some questions to come in. But as I'm not seeing anyone, um, somebody said very nice presentation, which I agree. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, given that that was the last question um, and we do have a couple of people saying great presentation, you did a really very good job. Um, so that concludes our webinar for today.
and the recording for this will be available on the NECAN website um, in the next day or two, so be sure to check that. Um, as I said earlier, the next scheduled webinar is um, not until March 8th, but um, there, there will be webinars scheduled in between, so definitely keep an eye out on our website and our newsletter as that schedule comes together. Um, thank you again, Amalia, and thanks to everyone for joining us today.